Hello, my name is Omar Awan, and I'm an associate professor of radiology here at the University of Maryland. Today, I'd like to discuss my approach to evaluating an MRI examination of the knee. And again, please feel free to take whatever pearls you'd like from this discussion. And there's multiple ways to evaluate a knee, but I'll tell you the approach that I use when I evaluate a knee. So I start usually with a sagittal T2 fat sat image of the knee, and what I look for is marrow I look at the marrow and I look for marrow edema. And the knee is divided into three different compartments, the medial femoral tibial compartment, which is right here, between the medial femoral condyle and the medial tibial plateau, the lateral femoral tibial compartment, which is right here along the lateral femoral condyle, the lateral tibial plateau, and the proximal femur, and then the patellofemoral compartment of the knee, right here between the patella and the femur. Okay, so those are the three compartments. So I start medially, and I look to see if there's any marrow edema, any T2 hyperintense signal within the marrow. And so far, this is a relatively normal knee MRI, so we don't see any marrow edema or hyperintense signal within the marrow to suggest a contusion or degenerative changes or any marrow-replacing process. I look then at the lateral compartment to see if there's any marrow edema. And again, we don't, the marrow looks nice and without any T2 hypertension signal to, to suggest marrow edema within the lateral femoral condyle, lateral tibial plateau, and the proximal fibula. Okay, then I'll scrutinize the patella just to make sure that there's no marrow edema and there's no marrow edema whatsoever here. Um, so that's what I do. And then I'll go ahead and I'll look at the coronal images to look at the marrow again. So this, again, is the medial compartment of the knee. This is the lateral compartment of the knee. And I'll look also at the cartilage, or the articular cartilage. The articular cartilage is this gray intermediate signal right here between the cortex, this hypo-intense hypo -intense, hypo -intense cortex. It's, it's this signal right here overlying the hypo-intense cortex. And we're looking for chondral defects or T2 hyperintense signal to suggest a focal chondral defect, a partial th thickness chondral defect, or a full chondral defect. And so far, we see no focal chondral defects within the medial femoral compartment of the knee. I turn laterally to look at the articular cartilage and notice that it's nice and gray and intermediate in signal intensity. There is no T2 hyperintense signal to suggest a partial thickness or a full thickness chondral defect about the lateral femoral tibial compartment of the knee. And then finally, to look at the patellofemoral femoral compartment, it's best to look at the axial images because you can see the patella right here. You can see the median ridge of the patella. You can see the medial patellar facet articular cartilage and the lateral patellar facet articular cartilage. And you can also see the trochlear cartilage right here, the medial trochlea and the lateral trochlea right here. And notice that it's nice and gray intermediate signal without any focal chondral defects. There may be minimal partial thickness chondral defect here along the medial patellar facet articular cartilage or chondral degeneration because we're seeing T2 hyperintense signal here. But again, it's involving maybe 20% of the width or the thickness of the articular cartilage here. Because we're right here, we can also take a look at the medial patellar retinaculum and the lateral patellar retinaculum, which are important support structures at the knee. And these are important because in patellar dislocation relocations, as you are, I'm sure, aware, the medial retinaculum gets torn in those instances. But we'd also expect there to be marrow edema in those in that in that diagnosis. For example, you'd have marrow edema along the lateral femoral condyle and the medial inferior medial patella, which we don't see in this case. Okay, It's also very important when you're evaluating the marrow to look at a T1 weighted image because a T1 weighted image will allow you to assess the content of the marrow to see if there's a marrow proliferative or a marrow replacing process. Here, the marrow is nice and fatty, so it's T1 hyper intense, as we'd expect. But if the marrow was iso-intense or hypo-intense to the underlying muscle, then you'd be worried about a marrow proliferative or a marrow replacing process. Red marrow reconversion will also appear somewhat dark, but it will be hyper-intense or brighter than the underlying muscle. And that's how you know and you're, you can be confident that it's red marrow reconversion. Okay, So T1 is very important to assess the marrow as well. The next thing I evaluate now that I'm done the, the cartilage and the bone marrow is I evaluate the menisci. And I'll start medially, and the medial meniscus is right here. It should be dark or hypointense on all sequences. It's a fibrocartilaginous structure. And as we come here, this is the medial meniscus. And as we cut through, you're going to see the anterior horn right here and the posterior horn right here. Notice that within the medial meniscus, the posterior horn is double the size of the anterior horn. That's true in the medial meniscus, and you should always be aware of that, because in the lateral meniscus, 
the anterior and posterior horn are equal in size. So it's important to know that the medial meniscus posterior horn is double the size of the anterior horn. And if you don't see double the size, then that means it's been truncated and you should be worried about a displaced tear or a radial tear or some sort of tear of the meniscus. And what you're looking for is to see signal within the meniscus that approaches and contacts the articular surface on at least two consecutive sequences. We don't see any such signal to suggest a meniscal tear here. We do see some intrasubsis signal within the meniscus, which may be related to vascularity or myxoid degeneration, but none of the signal is approaching the articular surface on one or at least two consecutive uh, images. So there's no evidence of meniscal tear there. We can go laterally and do the same uh, exercise. Notice that the anterior horn and the posterior horn are equal in size, and that's normal within the lateral meniscus. There's no signal that's contacting the articular surface on two or more consecutive sequences to suggest a meniscal tear. You should also be wary that as you're scrolling through, it should take four or less sequences, depending on your slice sequence, to divide the meniscus into an anterior and posterior horn to see two bow ties. So one, two, three, and four, you see two different bow ties. If you've gone five or six slices and you don't see that bow tie, you should be concerned that there may be a discoid meniscus. And again, that's dependent on the slice sequence. And you can look at a mid-coronal slice image, for example, here. And if the meniscus along the mid-coronal slice is going medial laterally more than 14 millimeters, you would be worried that there could be a discoid meniscus. And discoid menisci are more prone to tearing. They're more common on the lateral side than on the medial side. Okay, and then you always want to evaluate the meniscus in the coronal slice as well. You want to evaluate on all sequences, and here you want to make sure that you can trace it to its anterior root, which is difficult to see, but it's right here. And then you want to trace it, make sure there's no tearing, and then you want to see it along its posterior root right here along the tibia. Okay, and you want to make sure that it's not displaced medially or laterally more than three millimeters, because that means that there could be. Uh, displaced meniscal tear. And again, right here you see it along its anterior root, the lateral meniscus. You trace it all the way to its posterior root as well. Okay, And make sure that it's intact. So that's the menisci. That's the medial and lateral menisci evaluation. We can also look at it on an axial sequence. And you're looking for that nice C-shaped meniscus right here. This is the lateral meniscus. It's a little smaller. And here's the medial meniscus. Sometimes you can see the transverse ligament, which we don't see here, which bridges the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus to the anterior horn of the uh, posterior, anterior horn of the lateral meniscus to the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, excuse me. So you always want to be aware of that. And then the next thing after I've cleared the menisci, I look at the cruciate ligaments. This is the PCL, or the posterior cruciate ligament. It extends from the medial intercondylar notch to the and it inserts onto the extra-articular tibia. It should be a nice hypo-intense structure, as it is here. You can also look at the anterior cruciate ligament, which runs right here. It extends from the lateral intercondylar notch to the medial tibial spine. It's made of, up of the anterior, medial, and posterior lateral bundles. Notice that it parallels Blumenstadt's line, which is the slope here made by the posterior femoral condyle along the intercondylar notch. Uh, and it's, it's totally intact. We can confirm that on all views. So we can take a look at the coronal view as well. And we can see that this structure here is the PCL, where my arrow is, going from the lateral intercondylar notch. Excuse me, the medial intercondylar notch to the extra-articular tibia. And then the ACL is right here, going from the lateral intercondylar notch and inserting here onto the medial tibial spine. Okay, so those are the cruciate ligaments right there. You can assess those on an axial image as well. We can do the same thing. This is the PCL that we're seeing right here. And the ACL is the structure right here. Okay. The next thing I look at when I'm on the sagittal is, is I look at the extensor mechanism. I look at the quadriceps tendon. The quadriceps tendon is made up of four tendons, the rectus femoris most anteriorly, the vastus intermedialis most posteriorly in the vastus medialis and lateralis within the middle. That's why you have these striations. These striations are normal. They're not consistent with tendinopathy because you have four different tendons coming and it's that attaching onto the superior aspect of the patella. It should be, this is a normal appearance of the quadriceps tendon. 
You also want to assess the patellar tendon, which is this tendon right here. It goes from the inferior pole of the patella to the tibial tubercle. Now, the fact that you have intermediate signal here, proximally and distally, this is likely consistent with patellar tendinopathy or patellar tendinosis because you don't have multiple tendon fibers coursing through here like you do in the quadriceps tendon. So this is suggestive of patellar tendinosis or tendinopathy. I look to see if there's a suprapatellar effusion, if there's fluid here within the suprapatellar recess. There is some trace fluid here, but that's likely physiologic. You're allowed to have that much in the knee. This here is the infrapatellar bursa. There's some trace infrapatellar bursal fluid. That's likely also physiologic. This here is Hoffa's fat pad right here. That also looks good. Sometimes you can have infiltration of the fat within Hoffa's fat pad. I always look at the prepatellar soft tissues. And that's kind of what I look at when I look at the sagittal images. I again look at the T1 just to make sure that the marrow looks good. Look at the nice articular cartilage here, which is nice and gray. Intermediate signal. Nice thick cartilage there. The menisci are also nice to evaluate here on the T1. Again, we don't see any signal here approaching the articular surface to suggest tearing. We just see some intra-substance signal, which is within normal limits. This is the ACL. This is the PCL right here. Okay. Once I'm done that, then I move on to the chronal slices and I look at the medial and lateral support structures. So medially, I look at the medial collateral ligament, which runs right here from the medial femoral condyle to the medial tibia. And notice that it starts 5 to 7 centimeters above the joint line and inserts 5 to centimeters 5 to 7 centimeters below the joint line. And that's normal. To call, this is a normal hypo-intense curvilinear structure, as we'd expect. A grade 1 sprain would reflect thickening or, or periligamentous edema. A grade 2 sprain would be T2 hyperintense signal suggests partial tearing. And a grade 3 sprain would be a complete tear. Okay, we don't see any of that. Laterally, we're looking at four different structures. And starting most anteriorly, this is the iliotibial band, this dark hypointense structure. This inserts onto Jerdy's tubercle, or the anterior lateral tibia. It's formed more proximally at the hip by the iliac crest, the tensor fasciae latae, and the gluteus maximus uh, tendons. And then the next structure is this structure here going from the lateral femoral condyle to the fibular head. That's the fibular collateral ligament. That's normal. It may be slightly thickened, but it's likely within normal limits. Okay, that inserts onto the fibular head as a conjoined uh, structure with the biceps femoris tendon. See this muscle and then this dark hypotense structure? That's the biceps femoris tendon. That's going to insert onto the fibular head along with this fibular collateral ligament. They kind of share an insertion onto the fibular head. So it's this dark, thin structure right here that's going to come in and insert onto the fibular head there. And then the last structure is the popliteus tendon and muscle. It's these linear, dark, hypotense striations, which is the popliteus muscle of the popliteus myotennis junction. And it's going to come all the way here and insert right here onto the popliteal sulcus along the lateral femoral condyle. Its course goes like the way my arrow is going. So that's the popliteus tendon. So again, laterally, we look at the iliotibial band, the fibular collateral ligament, biceps femoris tendon, and the popliteus tendon right here. Okay, so those are the four structures that we look for laterally that are important for knee st uh, stability. And then I come to the proton density T1, and I just evaluate again the marrow. I look at the cartilage. I look at the menisci. I look at the medial collateral ligament, make sure it looks good on the T1. I look at the lateral support structures, again, the iliotibial band, fibular collateral ligament, biceps femoris tendon, and then the popliteus tendon right here. Okay, it's good to look at the cruciate ligaments again. Um, but everything so far looks good. And then finally, I'm going to come to the axial images, and I'm going to take a look at uh, just some structures here. So for example, I'm going to look to see, uh, we already assessed the medial and lateral patellar retinaculum. We already assessed the marrow. I'm going to look to see if there's a Baker cyst, and a Baker cyst forms here between the uh, semimembranosis and the medial gastrocnemius tendons. It would be right here. There's some trace fluid here, not quite enough to call a cyst, but there's some trace fluid within this, uh, the popliteal cyst or a Baker cyst. I also want to assess the vascular flow voids. These are the popliteal vessels, the artery and the vein here. Then I also want to look at the muscles. I want to look to see what the muscle and the muscular bulk is. So, you know, here medially, we have the vastus medialis muscle. Laterally, we have the vastus lateralis. This here is a sartorius muscle. This is the gracilis. This is the semimembranosis. Okay. This is a semitendinosis tendon. This is the bicep femoris tendon muscle and tendon, okay? The muscle bulk looks good. There's no T2 hyperintense edema to suggest a muscular contusion or a strain. This structure right here, posteriorly, is the posterior tibial nerve. 
this is the common peroneal nerve. Okay, they will join more proximally to become the sciatic nerve, but we, we're not quite at that level here. This is the posterior tibial nerve. This is the common peroneal nerve. That's going to course towards the biceps femoris muscle and tendon. Okay. Uh, one other thing that you should look for is the pessanserine bursa, which is this bursa that forms here just deep to these three tendons: the sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosus right here along the proximal medial tibia. You can get fluid there, and that can result in pessanserine bursitis. Okay, and then we just want to look at the subcutaneous tissues and make sure there's no edema or focal fluid collections or masses. And then we look at the proton density just to make sure that we can corroborate those findings. There's no atrophy within the muscles, no T1 hyperintensity signal suggests fatty atrophy. The muscular bulk here looks pretty good. And that's essentially how I evaluate a knee. So that is my search pattern to evaluate the MRI of the knee. We've evaluated the osseous structures, the cartilage, the joint. We've talked about the cruciate ligaments, the menisci, the extensor mechanism, um, and the muscles, and the bursae. And hopefully that gives you somewhat of a introductory or introduction to evaluate the images, uh, MRI images of the knee. Thank you so much for your time and attention.